Well, good evening, everyone. It's lovely to see you here this evening. Um, notices basically as the same this morning. The youth group starts again tomorrow, so do pray for that, 6.30 to late, um, with a bunch of people, about 10 young people, I think something like that. So do remember uh, to pray for that, um, if you can do. Um, Time for Tops is back on as well. Uh, and then on Wednesday evening at 7.30, we have the prayer meeting here as well. Saturday's, Saturday's ladies' breakfast at your house at... Nine o'clock. <laughs> That's going well, isn't it, so far? <laughs> and you haven't... I'm surprised it's... I'm surprised it's as short as that when women get together to talk, but never mind. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> just want to read a few verses from Isaiah 53. Um, Isaiah 53, really well-known passage, but it links in to what we're going to talk about later on. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, and yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. And all we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. Let's pray. Oh, Father, when we read those words about our Saviour, Jesus Christ, we too are taken back to that point when he cried out from the cross, Father, forgive them, because they do not know what they're doing. We read those words and it just reminds us of the pain and anguish our Saviour went through for us. It reminds us of the torture and torment he had to endure. It reminds us that Old Testament prophecy had to be fulfilled. It reminds us that he was the perfect son of God, who never sinned, never did anything wrong, followed perfectly the will of his Father. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who gave us salvation through his name for those that believe. So this evening, as we think of that gospel message and how it should affect us in our evangelism, gracious God, help us to keep in mind what he went through for us so that as we declare this amazing gospel message to others, we may do so with passion, telling our story, our testimony of our Saviour Jesus Christ. In his name, amen. amen. Well, our first hymn that we're going to sing together does pick up that amazing gospel message all the way through this hymn you have it I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me how he left the realms of glory for the cross on Calvary and then finishes beautifully says yes I'll sing that wondrous story of the Christ who died for me sing it with his saints in glory gathered by 
that crystal sea. Let's stand and sing this wonderful song together. There's a few things that I'd like to pray for this evening. I'm sure that most of you all know the news over the Iran-Israel situation and um, it just seems to get escalated more and more as time progresses, doesn't it? And the reaction from Iran over the US and things like that is, um, is a concern for us, uh, if we're going to be honest. So I want to pray for that. I still think we should pray for Ukraine. It's certainly disappeared off all the headlines at the moment, but there's still horrific things going on there to the point of where most of the infrastructure on power has been taken out, so we need to remember uh, that situation as well. Um, and also the situation in the US and the UK who are going to go through elections this year as well and that probably turn, change of power maybe in this country and maybe in America as well. So um, we need to pray that, that God's will will be done in these things. Um, I'd like to pray for the Diamond family as well this week. Um, for their situation uh, and also for Joan uh, and your situation as well. So let's come before our God in prayer. Father God in heaven, as we thought this morning, we know and we are confident that you are in control. There is nothing that is happening in this world right now that is beyond your power in stopping. There is nothing that is happening in this world right now that has caught you off guard and by surprise. You are a God who knows all things. You are the God who has the power to change anything. But as natural human beings, Father, we do get concerned, we do get anxious, we do get worried about what is happening, even if those events are happening thousands of miles away from us. So we do pray for the situation in Israel, pray for the situation in Gaza, pray for the situation with Iran as well, and for Libya and Syria, and 
all those areas around that part of the world. Father, there seems to be a huge amount of tension there. A huge amount of people wanting to have the last word, have the last bomb, have the last missile. A huge number of people who are wanting to see the other country have the last death, have the last person hurt. And yet, Father, we know in these situations, more often than not, it is those that are innocent that bear the brunt of these situations. More often than not, it is children that seem to be the most affected by these situations. So, gracious God, this evening, even though we know you are in complete control, we would just ask that you would work in an amazing way to calm the situation over there. May it be that the leaders of all those countries will just think and then think again before they act. May it be in some incredible way that no more bloodshed would take place. Father, we are so also aware that man doesn't appear to have any answers at all to the situations that are happening. So we have to come and plead to you as the God who knows all things and is so capable that you will give men the answers that they require and need, that you will move in people's hearts and minds in order that things will calm down and there'll be no escalation to what is taking place. Father, we also move our minds and our hearts to the Ukraine situation as well. So much of that has now disappeared off the news headlines because of the situation in the Middle East. But we know there are still many that are suffering hugely with what is taking place there as the power is being depleted by many eight areas being taken away. So, Father, again, we would come to you and plead for, plead for some sort of restraint to take place. Father, we pray for your church in Ukraine. It must be going through a torrid time as it tries to somehow declare your amazing gospel message and yet, and yet people are just suffering and dying and starving in that area. Father, we know many other countries which, again, go off the radar and yet are going through hard times. It wasn't that long ago before we prayed for the Afghan station situation and what happened there. So, Father, we continue to pray for them as well. We pray for the situations in India and Pakistan and many other areas of this world where there is difficulties and hardship and conflict and, and hate that takes place. Father, we know this is just part of the fall. It's just part of sin at its worst. So that does remind us that one day all this will be made new. All this will just stop and end. That one day there will be the final death. One day there will be the final harsh word. Because our Saviour Jesus Christ will come again. He will take those that are his to be with himself forever and eternity. And for those that have not bowed the knee to him, oh gracious God, we would pray for them. Because the alternative to heaven is horrific. The alternative to heaven is hell. So Father, as we, as we even thought at our home group a few weeks ago, we pray for people like Putin as well, the seemingly impossible to happen for him to be converted. And yet if Saul and the Damascus Road can be converted, gracious God, you have that same gospel and power so we would pray for people like Putin and others that they may bow the knee before it is too late and declare Jesus Christ as Lord. Father, for our own country and for America, we know that there could be significant changes taking place with leadership. So again, we are confident that you're in control and the right people will be in the right place at the right time. But we would pray for the elections that take place in the US and the elections that take place in the UK. Father, we know... So often than not, that the lines that they told us are, are what we want to hear rather than what we need to hear. There are lines which they want us to believe, which probably are less than true. So, Father, we would pray that truth will happen, that people will be willing to stand up and say, yes, this is the situation, this is what's going to happen. So we will know exactly what we should be voting for. But, Father, once again, we know that your will will be done. So the men and women which will be in charge at the end of this year in the US and in the UK will be the people that you want there. 
how gracious God we pray that they may trust you and believe in you. Wouldn't it be wonderful to think out in the US, in the UK, also we have people at the top of the countries who bow the knee to Jesus Christ. They realise that they have no authority or power unless it comes from you. So Father, we pray for that situation as well. Gracious God, we would pray for Joan here this evening. We thank you that even though her leg is not good, she still has the desire to come and worship with your people, to listen to your word being read and explained. Father, it is a, it's a powerful testimony to us here that how someone who goes through this discomfort still wants to be here in the house of God. Oh, Father, we pray for the, the nurses and those that are tending her leg. Father, we know that medicine can only do so much, but you have an incredible healing touch. So we would pray that you would touch and heal her leg, that it will be back to where it was before the incident took place. But Father, if that is not to happen, and sometimes these things don't happen, give her the, the patience to endure what she has to go through so that she may still be able to declare that Jesus Christ is Lord and I love him with all my heart, no matter what I'm going through. We pray for the same for Colin as well, and we think of him as he has a potential appointment later on. Father, gracious God, we pray that that may give answers to some of the problems that he's incurring. And once again, we pray that his love for you may not flounder, and he will understand, as Joan understands, that your love for them is far stronger than their love for you will ever be, and that you have them in the palm of your hand. Father, as we look at your word later on this evening and have the challenge, hopefully, which will come about from it, Father, we pray again that your word will speak and speak loudly, because we ask it in your name. Amen. Amen. Here is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood, when the prince of life our ransom shed for us his precious blood. Let's sing this song together.
We're going to turn to our first reading uh, tonight. We've got two readings uh, tonight. So Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. And we're going to start at verse 26. Um, the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Acts chapter 8, starting at verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go towards the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court of the official Candice, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture he was reading was this, like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does this prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? And Philip opened his mouth and began with this scripture, he's holding the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptised? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptised him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way, rejoicing. Before our next reading, we're going to sing How Deep the Father's Love for Us, How Vast Beyond All Measure That He Should Give His Only Son to Make a Wretch His Treasure.
We're going to continue Acts 9, the conversion of Saul, Acts 9, 1 to 19. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise, enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were travelling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him, so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptised, and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. Let's just pray before we look at this passage together. Gracious God, we just would ask that you're with us right now. Help me to explain my thoughts on this passage, help those that are here to listen. Gracious God, if anything is wrong, then please take that out of my mouth and out of people's ears. And what is edifying and what will build up and strengthen, help us to hold on to those words we pray, because we ask it in your name. Amen. Amen. This evening, for a few moments, I just want to think about the value of the one, the value of the one, whether that is the one person who is becoming a Christian that you'll talk to, or the one person yourself who is doing the talking to that other person. I don't know if you're a film buff at all, but some of you may know the film, have heard of the film One Life. It's a really good film. It's a story that Auntie Hopkins plays the part of Sir Nicholas Swinton. So Nicky, as he was well known, was a young London broker who in the months leading up to World War II rescued nearly 700 mainly Jewish children from the Nazis. It all started when he visited Prague in December in 1938 and found families who had fled from Nazi Germany and Austria and they were living in desperate hard conditions. No shelter, no food and under the Nazi invasion. He immediately realised that time was of the essence How many children could he save and rescue in that time before the borders are going to close? It came to the last train that he was hoping to get out. And the Nazis came on board that last train and many children were taken by the Nazis and never heard of again. So for 50 years until 1988, Nicky was haunted by the fate of the children that he wasn't able to save, even though he'd saved so many hundred He blamed himself for not doing more, but it was not until the BBC television show That's Life 
surprised him by showing him some of the surviving children who are then adults. And he began to realise the terms of the guilt and grief he had had started to disappear after five decades. It's an amazing true story of one man who made a huge difference to hundreds of lives at that time, potentially thousands upon thousands after that took place. Or maybe you're glued to the television sets over the post office situation. Maybe you've read books about it and seen the documentary that was on ITV, the story of Alan Bates as he campaigns for justice for hundreds, possibly thousands of people uh, linked with the post office and the Horizon software by Fujitsu. Many who will hopefully soon receive the justice and compensation they deserved because of one single man who was able to stand up and try and make a difference to so many. I used to love the Knight Rider series on TV <laughs> when I was young. Absolutely loved it. This crazy car, which used to do ridiculous speed, jump ridiculous lengths, that spoke to Michael Knight via the watch that he had with him. It was a fantastic show, but it was definitely deserved only to be in the 80s and not for today. But the motto for that particular show was this, one man can make a difference. One man can make a difference. So tonight I want to look at two men and two different stories that made a massive difference to just one person, and yet potentially thousands upon thousands benefited from that one particular conversion that took place. So five points to consider this evening. They're all brief, so don't worry. And we could look at how these two men uh, worked, what they did, and how we can apply the witnessing and our walk with God. First one is be ready and be available. So it's been said that many people um, are ready but not have any ability. They have availability but not ability. And while that is partly true, and I agree with the first statement a little bit, I think it's also important that we have ability as well as availability, and we'll see that in point four. But being ready or being available is vitally important if we're going to take seriously our calling to be a witness. Let's look at Philip in chapter eight of our book of Acts. Philip was being wonderfully used by God in Samaria. He was faithfully preaching the gospel message and people were listening to his gospel message. He was having a massive impact in that area of Samaria. In fact, so much so that chapter eight tells us there was great joy in the city due to Philip being there. He was having a huge impact there, both with men and women, even Simon, who practiced magic, was also converted in that area. He was having a dramatic effect for the gospel and a dramatic effect on people's lives, with happiness being all around him. And with all the success in Samaria, surely the best thing for Philip would be to do to stay where he was and continue the work that he was already doing, to build up the Christians maybe that had been converted, to challenge other people with the gospel message. That would be what we would think the logical, sensible thing to do. You're having success in an area, you continue that work of success in that particular area. But that wasn't to be. See, although Philip was incredibly busy and hardworking, he still made sure that he was ready and available for God to call him to new ground. He kept himself ready, he kept himself available, he kept himself close to God, so that if God had a different area for it to go in, he would be listening to his voice. What about Ananias? Ananias is a similar situation. Amazingly, we don't know anything about Ananias before Acts chapter 9. He's not listed anywhere. We don't know what he was doing, we don't know what sort of life he led. All that we do know is that we can safely assume because of the situation over Saul, he was then in hiding at home. We can safely assume that, as with the other, the other Christians in Damascus, the whole church was being threatened and they were scattering and making sure they hunkered down uh, in that area of Damascus because they knew that Saul was in his way. The church and Christian persecutor had got permission from Jerusalem to come and find those Christians in Damascus and drag them bound back. However, we can also be sure that he was ready and available if God called him to do something. It wasn't a case of that he hunkered down and got there and said, I'm not listening to anything, put the earphones on and said, that's it. He was still ready and available to whatever God had for him to do. So it's a bit like running a race in some ways, isn't it? They're there at the start line, waiting for the gun to go. And you know what happens if they go early, it's a false start. 
they are either called back to start again, or in worst case scenarios, I think now, it's even they're out of the race straight away. That false start is so important. And we can be the same as well. We thought about waiting on God, didn't we, on, on Wednesday and on the last Sunday. It's really important that we wait for God's calling. Don't jump ahead. Don't have that false start and take ourselves in the wrong direction. Wait. Be ready and be available in case God wants us to take us into a certain area. However, it's one thing to be ready and available, but it's another thing to be listening to what God has to say. Sometimes we can be ready and available and listen to the wrong voices. Sometimes we can be ready and available and think we have to listen to our own voice. We have to listen to God's voice, to God's call. And that takes us to point number two. So if we look back to Philip, the last words on Philip in Samaria were in verse 13. It says that Simon believed and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. As we said, Philip was being amazingly used by God. He was healing the fit sick physically. We know that from the miracles that he was doing. He was healing people spiritually. We know that by the conversations that were taking place. We know that from Simon, who was, uh, became a Christian. Staying put is logical. It's a sensible thing to do. However, for Philip, things are about to take one dramatic change. So God, through an angel, told Philip to travel in the direction of Gaza on a desert road. To Samaria was a vibrant place. It was, it was the things that were happening in Samaria. There was crowds of people in Samaria. It was a buzzing place. It was a place where Philip would have seen loads of people all the time. But now he's got to head from Jerusalem to Gaza on a desert road. And we think, why? Why was that, why was that happening? That travel in that area was going to be a difficult journey to take at the best of times. But Philip wasn't just ready and available. Philip was listening to God's voice. He was listening to God's call. With all that was going around him, all the buzz and the hype and the excitement and the work that he was doing, he still had his eyes listening to what God wanted to say to him. Ananias, however, was in a very, very different situation. He was hiding, just like the other Christians in Damascus. However, we're not given the impression that he was despondent. We're not given the impression that he was not in prayer. He certainly could have been despondent. He couldn't justify that in some ways. He had to leave the other believers in that area. They had to make sure that they lied low until the dangerous Saul had moved on. You just imagine the disappointment they had of not meeting together. How would we feel if suddenly we were told you can't meet together to worship God? You can't build each other up and strengthen each other in the faith. You can't communicate with each other, maybe on now WhatsApp or things like that. You can't have fellowship together. All that's got to stop. How would you feel if you're hunkered down at home? Worried about your own situation? Worried about other people here in the church? You could understand, actually, if he did feel a bit low, a bit disappointed, a bit fed up. But we're told in God's word that God called him in a vision And immediately, without any delay, without any questioning, without any hesitation, he got up and answered, yes, Lord. I'm here, I'm ready, I'm available. What do you want me to do? Ananias was not like Philip. He was not loving and enjoying the situation he was in. Philip was having a great time. It says there was great joy when Philip was around. Ananias was a prisoner in his own home. Ananias was basically hunkered down, locked up, waiting for time to pass because of what was going on. Both men, very different situations, but both men were listening to God's call for action. They both stayed close to God. They communed with God. They prayed with God. They had fellowship with God, even if they couldn't have fellowship with anybody else, so that when God had a task for them to do, they were listening to him, ready and waiting for action. You know, I think we all have to admit sometimes we have crazy busy lives. We're involved in this, we're involved in that, we're involved in the other, and then we start again and it just seems to spiral and we get to the point where everything's so busy around us. Are we spending time listening to God? Or is everything just so, so busy around us that we just stop listening to what God has got to say to us? We're too busy maybe with work. It tends to take over our whole life. So it's so important that we can't think of anything else but work. Maybe our school life, maybe our friends, maybe our hobbies, some good things, not some good things. We're too busy spending time with these things 
that actually we forget to spend time with God. We forget to spend time listening to what he has to say. So potentially we've missed out on a calling that he's asking us to do. And we could get also very despondent, maybe like Ananias did, with the world situation or our own country's situation even. You know, we can be dull to God's voice because we're so bugged down with what's happening in different parts of the country that that becomes our, our focus and that becomes the, the pressure on our heads and on our hearts. It is right that we pray for our country, don't get me wrong. It is right that we pray for the world situation. But as we have thought, man has no answers to these situations, only God. So it is right that we spend time in prayer, in fellowship with our Father in heaven, so that when his voice speaks, we are listening to what he has to say. Because one day, you never know, one day, he might have an amazing task for us to do for him. The question is, are we ready? Are we available? Are we spending time listening to what he has to say to us? But as we said, it's one thing to be ready and available. It's another thing to listen. But it's also another thing, thirdly, to act or react to God's calling. So Philip was not just ready. He wasn't just listening, but he also acted upon what God said to him. So he said, the angel of the Lord said, go, in verse 26. And in the very next verse, he says, he started out. No delay, no questioning. Why? Because he was so sure of God's voice and what God wanted him to do because he was listening to his voice. He was obedient and he went. Not an easy journey, not an easy thing to leave Samaria with all that was going on, but the result was going to be one massive dramatic impact on someone's life. And who knows after that, a dramatic impact on maybe thousands of other people as the gospel message can be taken into the country of Ethiopia. But why? Why would he just pack up and go just like that? I mean, we can assume that Philip didn't have any earthly ties, if you like, to Samaria. We're not told of any reason that his family was there or anything like that. Well, the simple answer is they just wanted to go because he wanted to do God's will. He wanted to be close with God. And who knows, maybe he was thinking that there might be some sense of, wow, what's God going to do when I go to Gaza area? Is he going to work the same way in Gaza that he worked in Samaria? Maybe there was a sense of trepidation, maybe a sense of excitement, maybe the sense of that brand new adventure that's going to take place for him. After all, he'd seen amazing things and done amazing things in Samaria. What was going to happen on this new adventure that God had called him to do? And on the road, I expect there were many chariots, maybe many people, Many people that Philip could have gone and spoken to, many chariots that he could have tried to get in contact with. But we're not told that Philip went and approached the chariots. That doesn't come out in God's word at all. What it says is go to, depending on what version you've got, go to this chariot or go to that chariot. Very specific. This teaches us a huge important lesson, doesn't it? About waiting upon God, not having that false start. Because we might spend time talking to someone else about the Christian gospel message when actually God wants us to talk to someone else. And we're missing that opportunity because we're not waiting for his direction, not waiting for his time. He said to Philip, don't don't worry about anybody else, just go to that chariot. That is the one that I want you to go to. That is the one that I want you to speak to because someone there needs to hear the gospel message. Verse 29, go to that chariot. Philip hadn't learned that he needs to wait for God's direction and wait for the calling. Ananias was slightly different. His destination was certain. Philip was told to head in the general direction of Gaza. We're not told they actually went to Gaza. We're just told he went in that general direction. Ananias was basically given an address to go to, if you like. He said, go to Straight Street, Judas's house. There was no sense of in the vicinity of. It was pretty specific. That is the house, that is the street, that is where you go and head. Just to also say this is highly unlikely to be the Judas of the, uh, that betrayed Jesus. But unlike Philip, Ananias had had questions. He knew of Saul, 
Saul's reputation had way gone before him, so he knew what Saul was like, he knew what his men was like, he knew what they'd done to believers, he knew what the likelihood is that they would do to believers in Damascus if they got hold of him. So you can sort of understand Ananias being a little bit cross and a little bit fed up and thinking, why on earth would you want me to go to this man? This is the sort of guy that would want to kill me and all my other brothers and sisters in Christ in this area. But even with those questionings, even with the nervousness of meeting Saul, Ananias still obeyed God. God explained to him in detail that Saul was now a believer and that he was going to take the gospel message and he was going to suffer for it. There's a group of people that amaze me, that I'm in awe of, and that I think are quite incredible. That group of people is missionaries. Missionaries are amazing people, especially if they have a family, to sometimes go overseas maybe to a foreign land, to have to learn foreign languages, to have to learn different customs, maybe not the safest places in the world, shows just how incredibly they're committed they are to being ready and available, listening to God's voice, and then acting upon what God has to say to them. They are amazing people. And I'm sure God makes up to them hugely what they miss out between having fellowship in their local churches. I'm pretty much in awe of people like that who are willing to give up so much for the Christian faith. But just because we're in literally sunny Herefordshire this evening doesn't mean that we're not going to have our own challenges if we want to take this mission seriously. God may come and speak to us and say, I want you to speak to that Christian or that school friend that you know of. I want you to speak to that college or university student that you are with. You know that work colleague that really annoys you? I want you to go and speak to them about the gospel. What about the person over the road that you never seem to get on with? I want you to speak to them about the gospel. So we have no idea what God has got in store for us, whether it's going to be near with our neighbours and friends, or whether it's going to be far away like Ben and Esther, the other side of the world. But whatever it is, it's so important that we are ready, we're available, we are listening, and then we're obedient to the call of God. Because he might say to us, I want you to speak to that person and that person may become a Christian and it might just spiral like a pebble in a river. But it does give us this one challenge that if we're going to go to that person, do we know, fourthly, the gospel? Do we know the gospel? Philip, in verse 30, the question on the man's lips when he did a reading is, did you understand what you are reading? And the response was, no, I have no idea, I don't understand it, please will you explain it to me? And we're all sitting here thinking, wow, what an amazing opportunity. If only the person I spoke to said, explain it to me, I'd love to know more. Probably what we dream about hearing from someone. Philip wasted no time in explaining all about Jesus, starting from the very passage in Isaiah 53 that we read at the beginning, which is also in Acts 8. Philip knew the message. He knew it so well because it had changed him and he knew that same gospel message would change this man as it had done maybe hundreds of people in Samaria. And it did. The result of a conversation with a new brother in Christ and then taking that gospel message to a new country in Ethiopia. Philip knew the gospel message. Ananias in chapter 9 was slightly different. He had no need to convert Saul. His encounter with God had already taken place. He was already changed. He was already a believer in Jesus Christ, just like Ananias. But what I find fascinating is the way how Ananias greets Saul. So you could think, actually, Ananias was going to go in with a little bit of trepidation, maybe want to check it out first to make sure there wasn't this going to be a, some sort of trap happening, make sure there's nobody hiding around the corner to go and arrest him and grab him. But how did he... Greet Saul, he said the word brother. Brother. Not, oi, Saul, come here, I need to talk to you. But brother. Ananias welcomed Saul with a greeting that is common ground between the two of them. They're both now brothers in Christ. Remember, this is the first time Ananias had seen Saul, only heard what had happened. No matter what had happened in the past, they were now adopted into the family of God together. And it says, Ananias baptised Saul, just like Philip did with the Ethiopian eunuch, which also I find amazing, because remember they were going down a desert road, and down desert roads there's not much water. And yet they seem to come across it, and he was baptised there. 
Ananias welcomed Saul into the family. He showed them the disciples. They met together. They could see he was a changed man. And they spent time explaining and teaching Saul, equipping him for the service that God had for him. The challenge for us is, do you know the gospel? Yes, you may be a believer. You may be a Christian. You may say you understand the gospel. But do you know the gospel? If someone said to you, explain it to me. Would you think, oh my goodness, where do I start? What do I do? Well, in the beginning, God created. Do we start there at the very beginning? Do we think about maybe the Ten Commandments and all those laws and regulations going through Judges and Kings and Chronicles? How do we say and explain the gospel? The easiest way is it's personal to you and me. It's your story. It's my story. It's the story of our Saviour's birth, death, life, resurrection. The gospel message should be on our tongues and on our lips at all times, ready when that moment comes when someone says, explain to me what Jesus means to you. We're able to instantly be able to tell them what the gospel message is all about and how much it means to us. It's that moment that God brings someone towards us who asks the question and they need to hear the message. We are ready. We know the gospel message. We know what impact it has on our lives. We know what impact it has on other people's lives. We know what Jesus Christ has done for us. We know what he did on the cross. We know that he rose again three days later. We know that it's nothing to do with apologetics, really. It's nothing to do with creation and evolution issues. Those can all come later. We need to tell them about Jesus. We need to tell them what Jesus can do for them as what Jesus did for us. Do you know the gospel message? Not just know it, but really know it and able to communicate it to others. Are we ready and available? Do we listen and waiting for what God is going to say? If we've listened, do we then act upon what God is going to say? If we're going to act upon what God is going to say and know the gospel, then finally, in, verse, in number five, we have to be willing to be moved on. Which is a bit of a scary thought sometimes. Because sometimes we feel, actually, I'm quite comfortable where I am. I'm quite comfortable with the friends I've got. I'm quite comfortable with maybe sharing the gospel with these few people that I know and actually understand me, even though they may think I'm a bit crazy and weird. But they, they're okay. They accept that's where I am and that's what I believe. But are we willing for God to actually say, you know what, I need you to move on somewhere else. I need you to move on to pastors new. You've done what you wanted to do here, what I've called you to do. I'm now calling you to a totally different area of the country or even the world. Are we ready to be moved on? So I expect Philip would have loved to have spent more time with that Ethiopian eunuch. After he baptised him, I expect he would have loved to have got back in the chariot and, and talked through other things to do with the gospel. Maybe explain to him other things in God's word. To have fellowship with him, explain baptism, what it means, and, and, and loads of things that they would have liked to have gone through together. I suspect Philip would have loved to have done that. But what happens? In verse 39, God took Philip away to Azotus, which is now Ashdod, just north of Gaza. That was it. His meeting with the Ethiopian eunuch had finished, had completed. God took him away, moved him on to somewhere else. And it's the same for Ananias as well. Once he was introduced to Saul, once he then introduced the disciples, we don't hear about Ananias ever again. He'd moved on. He'd gone to his next work that God had called him to do. 